Um, what I'd really like to do is take the opportunity this evening with a one-hour slot to introduce you to um, some projects and some people who have really affected uh, the way I work and what I make. And what I want to start with first is an anonymous email that was sent to me. And I've never found out who sent this. Um, and if they're in the audience, I would love them to talk to me afterwards. So the subject was letter of complaint. And it goes, Dear Mr. Clark, I've been looking at your work for some time now and have continued to find it both appalling and bizarre that it is, has been allowed into some of the most renowned galleries and silver collections in the world. Is this intended to be some sort of joke? All you seem to be able to do is take work of others, much more highly skilled makers than yourself, and then mutilate it with obscure, unnecessary additions. What a waste of silver. As if that wasn't bad enough, upon closer inspection, and with further research, it becomes apparent that you actually contaminate your silver with lead. Do you even understand how wasteful this is? Silver is precious, it is pure, and it is a beautiful material. It is makers like yourself who pollute the good name of many contemporary silversmiths, coming up with interesting functional designs as well as beautiful sculptural pieces. I simply do not understand how you can be making any money from what you are doing. Though I understand that you are employed as an educator, and I suspect that your sole source of income is this. May you either stop making altogether, or start making real silversmithing. So, that was really fascinating to receive. Uh, intriguing that someone put so much effort into contacting me. And I really wanted to speak to them and have a conversation, not in defense, but in really having a very open talk about what the issues are, where the problems are, and where they see bigger problems. London is my home. It is my center of play. It is where I come back to for projects. And the first project, no, this is the workshop. Um, so this is a private space um, dead center in London. I share with two other silversmiths, one Simone Ten Hompel, who's German, and Adi Tok, who's Israeli. And we have this top roof space um, which we share, which is huge and extraordinarily cheap. The thing that is really important... Lean in or out? In. The one object that's really important for me within the workshop is the table. The table is where I invite people to come in and to interact and I feed them. And to bring food and silversmithing is a genius but really, really simple idea. I cook. I should never have been a silversmith. Uh, my retirement will be cooking. And it was a few years ago where I set up with three other makers the Cake Committee, which was an illegal cake baking group. Um, we sold everything for charity. So that meant that we could cook everything at home and not have to comply to health and safety. It was highly competitive. Um, it was incredibly popular. Um, we had press in London, we had press in Japan. We had um, threats from email that people hadn't been invited and how upset the general public, some of the general public were. It actually became so popular that we had to close it down. But, you know, sugar, cake, tea, it all works. And the conversation that goes on around it, the discussion, 
to ease the access to understanding of food. We all are not intimidated that much by the stuff that goes in our mouth. This was an exceptional sour cherry frangipan tart. Spaces for me are really interesting, and coming from a really urban space like London, which is packed, um, I don't understand the countryside. I don't know what you do in there. I don't understand what the point of it is. But there's a space, there is a space in between, in between the city and the rural environment, which is untangible. It's kind of a transit space. It's undefined. It's quite weird. This is in between Chicago and Milwaukee. And they're kind of quite strange. We're not quite sure what goes on. We don't know what the function of them is. We don't know what really the purpose of them are. Yeah, it's kind of storage, it's kind of stuff. But, you know, some old cars. And there I think it's really interesting. You know, this kind of ambiguous space that we're not sure how to talk about it, what to do in it, where it goes, how it's, how it's defined. And for me, I'm very curious about that within craft. It's like, what are the spaces that are there that give us opportunities to really develop different types of thinking, different types of, of objects? And so I was very happy to get this train. I love trains. Trains are fantastic. And so you can just sit there, look out the window, and just really, really think about stuff. I do a shitload of, sorry, my language is going to get worse. I do a shitload of traveling. And um, with my work um, and uh, and teaching, I, I travel a lot around the world. And so I, I spend a lot of time in this sort of transitory space of airports, bus stations, train stations, taxis, these really odd places. Within these odd places, I get really triggered by observation. My observation is really, really important for me that I have time to be removed, but also can just access these things that trip me up. And this was in London. And we just got a series of, of images which for me, they just stopped me in my step, and it's like, how did that happen? What's going on? Who did it? And why the hell is it still there? <laughs> and so it touches on repair, it touches on mend, it touches on just getting on with it and making a really honest situation of a bad they're all right footed shoes <laughs> <laughs> who nicked all the left ones it's like where are who's, who's got the left ones <laughs> and so I, file, I find a lot of joy and a lot of uh, potential stories in these kind of mishaps and these errors and the, this kind of situations which when you're so busy living and so busy just getting on with life that you can just absolutely forget and not really view or acknowledge. The first gentleman that I have to acknowledge is this devil called <laughs> Henry Baptiste. Um, he is a silver plater but he's also been banned from eBay from selling counterfeit goods um, he's got a really appalling reputation, and he's a really good friend. Um, when I meet with him, I always go, I don't know whether you, in Britain we have these things called pork pies, which are like a meat base and then pastry, and it's cooked in fat. They're fantastic. And you have it with mustard. He loves pork pies. And again, food, it works every time. If you want a discount, offer them food. And so I go to Henry. Um, he used to do silver plating for me, but I don't do that anymore. But I go and talk to him, and actually he's a fantastic reference point for getting really honest discussion, debate, and critical thinking around the work that I do. He's one of the very few people around that I would absolutely have an open conversation with. Friends, family, they're all liars. Do not ask them. They'll tell you it's nice. So Henry really pissed me off because he didn't do a job for me. So I said, you owe me a piece of work. And he, this was the first teapot he gave me. Uh, but before he gave it to me, he, um, it's pewter. And so he burnt a hole in the side of the teapot so I could never use it as the teapot. 
and this was the first deconstructed one that I did. And I, I was, with this piece, I was very interested in being highly respectful with the teapot. So I was pretending, I was really pretending to be a jeweler, um, which I have no interest in being, um, and setting these elements together. But really messing them up, turning them around, looking at the potential of the oddity of the things that we see in the right position we don't acknowledge. They don't necessarily refer to other things. And then as soon as you put them into a different context, they start to refer to extraordinarily different aspects of life. So this is a very quick overview of the series of, of, bringing, oops, of uh, bringing lead into work. This idea of robbing an object of its function, of bastardizing an object, of stealing all of its opportunity, um, taking away its history, giving it a new opportunity, and rendering it completely dysfunctional. Sorry. It was at this point that I was really sick of silversmithing um, and I really needed to reposition myself in the field. I really needed to take a new stance of, of where I wanted to be, the type of conversations that I wanted to have and where I wanted to, to place the work out in the world. And the work that I did before all of this was, is extremely different um, and very, very mainstream. Um, but I really, I really needed to shift my practice and it was really important. And, and actually what I did was I called all the stock in, melted it down, and the galleries were furious. And um, so I started doing this, which was great. Um, so I, I started to, to really concentrate on not finishing objects in a traditional way. So this idea of filing and papering and polishing, it was just that like, I'm not doing any of that anymore. And so this idea of hiding marks, of polishing things away, it's just like that's not going to be an opportunity within these pieces. So if there was a shit solder thing, it was going to stay in the object. I was going to reveal my failing in my making in the final object. And I had students that came up to me and they're like, you can't solder. You don't know how to solder. And I was like, <laughs> have another look. Billy is a fantastic man. He works for the most extraordinary factory in Sheffield, which is in the north of the UK. And the company is called Wentworths. And they are a pewter company, and I give them as much work as I possibly can. It's a small family, and they are so professional. It's absolutely amazing to, to work with these people. Um, and they produce work for me, um, and I work with their team um, to work out complex objects and uh, so, uh, getting to solutions. I love this. This is his teacup. But what he gets is he gets shim off the pewter that goes into his tea. So he just chucked this lid on it that the, that the spoon could come out from. And it's just fantastic. And he was like, what are you taking a photograph of? And I was like, don't worry. It's no problem. And so I went up there to, to produce this piece last year, and it took four of us um, to sit down. And this, again, this sharing is absolutely, for me, is absolutely essential. You know, to not, hierarchically, I am not better than them. Um, I want to sit down with them as a team and to really talk through problems, ideas, possibilities, and work through that. So it's, it's you know, it's, it's not like I, I don't feel I'm commissioning them because they're absolutely part of the process. Um, and so to work that way is absolutely fantastic. And it's about giving them time. You know, I don't do that through email. I don't through, do that through Skype. I get on a train and I go up there face to face and really sit down with them, get to know them, talk to them. And that relationship is long lasting. You know, I've worked with them for now over 20 years and they would do absolutely anything. And it's, for me, it's about investing in individuals for the right reasons. Now this is a really, this I actually did for Chipstone. Um, so this shows um, the beginning of investigation in looking at material. So this is showing how lead eats through silver. And so lead, again, is absolutely forbidden from the silversmithing workshop. 
And I wanted to really bring this in to really challenge the hierarchy within materials. And so, you know, silver's, you know, as that email said, it's precious, it's beautiful, and blah, 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 which is really not interesting. Um, and so it's about reformulating different kind of um, transformative objects that can really offer different expressions. And so here you just see the process. So this is done in the oven as well and not within the workshop, and I'll talk about that later. Highly toxic, nasty. I don't recommend doing it. But I really wanted to take the material apart. I really wanted to understand what silver could offer that I'd not seen before. And so I needed to go to some extremes to really identify different qualities and different values that I could then relate to. Um, and also this, this also touches on society. It's like who are the top dogs in society? Who is revered as the shit ones? Um, what chance do they have? When do they meet? What happens when they meet? From lead, I go to salt. And so salt, this, I bring in my baking experience. So again, this is made within the kitchen. So I use um, the oven that you just saw. So I bake this on gas mark two for 12 hours. And so the antique silver goes into a brine solution. And then the water evaporates out. And then you get the salt crust. What is beautiful for me about this is that I have more emails from ceramic students asking me what the glaze is rather than the silversmith asking me what I've done to it. So that transference over from disciplines, for me, is absolutely a delight. The fact that this is miscategorized is super. The reason I did it was when I was at college, the first piece of silver that I wanted to make, I said I want to make a salt cellar, and the staff said you can't, because salt corrodes silver, which is why it's gilded or has a glass liner. So I wanted to take this up. And again, reflection, I think, is highly important, highly undervalued, highly underrated within practice. Going to the opposite side, sugar and conserving the most romantic, nostalgic, sickening aspects of silver that I detest. Um, so this takes six months. I do none of the work whatsoever. I buy it on eBay, it goes in another box, it goes to Natalie Smith, who's a fantastic sugar artist, and she does the sugaring for me. And again, so it's really looking at the history and the heritage of the, of the discipline and, and then reinventing it and rechallenging it in as many aspects as I can possibly find and develop. Again, taking a series of highly functional objects and to really pulling out the qualities of the character, looking at how they stand. In London, I follow people, and people inspire the work. I listen to people on mobile phones. Um, I steal mobile phone conversations that then become titles. Um, and titles are another entrance into the work um, for people that are more comfortable with written word rather than a visual language. Steady Eddie came to me broken. Um, I needed a serious fix. One leg missing and a hole in the belly. Um, the thing that I really wanted to do was find the shittiest wheel that I could possibly find. And that took the greatest amount of time. Some of this work, some of the jugs take about 20 minutes to make. And it's about that speed and that willingness to really respond and react to the objects and then surgically go in and really work with the forms and bring in relevance to these dead objects. All of the objects that I collect are redundant. All of them are close to the bin. All of them are not required. And it's about taking these hopeless things and giving them a new opportunity. So this one is called Who Me and highly introvert. Pause beautifully. Up the duff, do you know, does that make sense, up the duff? Um, so up the duff is if um, you were pregnant, you would say you were up the duff. It's, it's kind of London slang. So you hear it on the streets. And so again, this kind of common, common language with posh object, you know, so it's, it's at every point where can you knock down the silver 
to get it into a different position and into a different relationship. These, this series was made for a solo exhibition in Sweden, which was really interesting because they're the most politest Europeans you will ever meet. The beautiful story is that there were two 60-year-olds that came into the exhibition, thought it was, again, a great reaction, thought it was the most ugliest work they'd ever seen, picked up a piece and smashed it on the floor. The gallery was super upset. I was absolutely delighted. <laughs> what really worked was I got the insurance money and then I sent the piece to the people that smashed it up so they now own it. <laughs> <laughs> so I win twice over. So a suicidal jug called Drip. This one's interesting. It's, it, it farts beautifully when it pours. And if I tried to design that and work it out, I would never be able to do that, ever. And so messing around with these pieces, what I do is I try and collage these together so nothing's permanent until it's doing what I want it to do. So I take these pieces apart, I snap them off, I rebuild them, reconfigure them. I make really shit pieces before they become good. And it's that trialing and trialing and tri it's like what Kim said, you've got to do it and do it and do it and do it till you're sick in the face and then you do it again and then you've got a smile on your face. And if you make a jug that farts at the end of a hard day, it's just like, come on. <laughs> in Transit was an exhibition that I co-curated in 2019 in Schmuck. Um, I have a pathological hatred for Schmuck. Um, it's far too much jewellery for me. Um, and we wanted to object to the jewellery with objects. So this was the final, we did, I think we did either three or five, um, in an old bronze casting foundry within, within Munich. And this was the last one called um, In Transit. And I really wanted to use that, that method of, of transit as a method of making. So I made some objects and I packed them into a suitcase, not very well. And what I wanted to do, again, is this, this notion of overworking work. It's like within all disciplines, this idea of finishing, we can murder a piece of work. We can rip the soul out of a piece and render it a piece of old crap. And that's just doing too much making. And so for me, it's like, when do you stop? When do you stop your process? When is enough enough? And when are you communicating what you want to communicate? So I got this old suitcase, I filled it up, checked it in, and I have to stress, this is not a collaboration. Checked it in with Lufthansa, and the luggage men did their work. And what came out was this knocked up, dented, ripped, bruised objects, which I could never have made in the workshop. If I'd have tried to make this, they would have looked so, now what's the word? Uh, forgotten. Um, crap. And it was a whole series, it was about 13, 14 pieces. And so I was working with lead, which is really like butter. It's absolutely fantastic. And so this idea of letting go of the finishing and allowing someone else to finish off your work really struck a chord with me. It's like, I do not want to be known as a master. I have no desire to perfect my skill. I don't do, I do my very best not to do master classes. I don't want to be put into that situation and that hierarchical ranking. And so I do different, I work differently and I act differently. This then worked into this piece, which is called One Day My Plinth Will Come, um, where all those pieces were made beautifully. Then I climbed up a 12 foot ladder and dropped them. And that was the consequence of the drop. And what was really interesting here was, um, Okay, so lead, highly poisonous. These objects were highly tactile, and when they were shown, they didn't stay on the plinth that they were shown on. They disappeared. People were handling them, cuddling them, sharing them, stroking them. I was like, what are you doing? And then I began to realize that this thing with finishing and this thing with surface, you know, it can actually be a barrier against the audience. It can actually t turn people off your work. If you dropped this, you wouldn't know. It would be okay. You know, there's scratches in there, there's markings in there, there's lumps of solder in there. It's already pre-damaged. And so for me, it refers back to historical old objects that already have a patina on it, 
and it's like, it's okay. It's not that polished surface where your fingerprints go onto the surface and then you're like, I need to get polishing. Spare Parts 2013 was my first solo exhibition in London um, with Gallery SO. And they said to me, we want you to do a really amazing new body of work. And I was like, okay. And I spent, I think, maybe six weeks working on this. It's all pewter. Um, there's no um, historical or old objects in there. And this was the opening night, which looks like sales night at a department store rather than white trash in a gallery, which I rather enjoyed. The gallery was hysterical. They thought everything was going to get stolen. And it's like, I don't think so. Um, it was an absolute pleasure to be there and to test out this thinking that I had, which I didn't know would work or, or not, but there was a lot of thinking into to what went on with this project. And so I think there were about 28 objects that slotted together, that fitted together. So I would lose the control of the objects. I was no longer the author of the objects that they created because they could make what they wanted to do. I also lost the curatorial, curatorial position because if I went in before you, you would see the objects that I made, not the person before me. So this was an ever-changing, ever-developing, rotating display of stuff. The table was essential. It was slightly higher. The cloth on it was even more essential, so you didn't get that bang or crash of metal. So it dulled it right down, so there was never that horror of metal on metal. And people just came in and broke all the rules. And so when we think about the opportunity to exhibit, how do we exhibit, and what, we do, what do we do with how we show? There are a multitude of opportunities, and there's also those traditions of the white plinth. And it's like, what do we want to challenge, and how do we want to challenge it? So at every opportunity, I try and do a twist, a slight revolution of standing to see where I can offer um, different thinking and different questions that come into the work. This, for me, was gold. I have never listened to a piece of work, ever. I don't know this man. I have no idea who he is. He walked around the gallery for 20 minutes listening to that piece of work. And it's those experiences which really, really last for me. They're, they're the experiences that I really pull out of this continual journey of, of testing and, and risk-taking to see what the consequences are of what we put out. These people are really, really important to us. I don't make for me, I make for them. And again, it's about that sharing opportunity and what comes back, and if it gets right, you get so much information which you can then feed back in and really use resourcefully. And I listen to every piece of work at the bench. The people that I share the workshop with think I'm a lunatic, but that's OK. Also, the other opportunity to use the price list. So for those people that were really nervous of, of holding the objects and playing with the objects, they could build the most filthiest named objects by combining words together to make dirty titles out of the words that I presented to them. So you build, you construct through the words, not through the forms. I should have sold the prices because it was the most popular thing in the exhibition. And this is a quick film, just to sh it's really shit, sorry. But it just shows the, the, the shifting of the exhibition and how it moved through, through the time that was there. And for me, it's fantastic to go in and see people playing with the work. They were offering new solutions to the forms that I'd done that I would never have put together. Ever. And don't you just love a good mistake? Some of the best guests are the forbidden guests. Love a British pigeon. Ken and Nancy. Hearty Americans. 
I was at RISD for five weeks several years ago, and I was desperate to buy some sterling silver spoons from America. I couldn't get them anywhere. The antique markets were just ridiculously expensive. eBay America wouldn't sell to me, but Ken came up trumps. Nancy was a nightmare. These were the spoons that they sold me. And so I was at Providence, Rhode Island, and they were like, oh my God, you're British. And I was like, yeah. And like, can we come and see you? And I was like, no. And they're like, <laughs> I was like, I just want your spoons. And they're like, yeah, but you're British. And I was like, and? And they're like, do you work for the Queen? And I was like, no. And they're like, let's go and have dinner. And I was like, look, I just want some fucking spoons. And they're like, no, let's go for a drink. We're going to come. No, we're here. And I was like, okay, I'll come for a drink. So they met all their really great mass, loads of friends. And I was like, shit. And, and then Nancy was like really holding onto a box. And so she's like, here are my beautiful spoons. And I was like, great. And she was like, what are you going to do with them? I said, I'm going to chop them up. And she's like, she's like, you're going to chop up my babies. And I was like, no, they're spoons. They're just spoons. And she wouldn't give them to me. And so I was, like, I was pulling on the box, and she was pulling on the box. And then I was pulling on the box, and she was pulling on the box. And in the end, I pulled hard enough that I got the box, and I got the spoons. And so I legged it out of the pub and um, went into the studio. Now, what was really interesting about this, and again, this is where people and generosity really comes in. Ken and Nancy had no idea about contemporary craft, making, silversmithing, anything. Through the emails that I had with Ken after that, he ended up buying back some of the spoons that he sold me. And so you never know where your clients are going to be. You never know where the interest is. You never know when you can educate the audience to be that convinced that your work is good enough for them to reinvest. Now they know what they sold those spoons for. And they didn't even blink for what they bought those spoons back for, because I tell you, it was a shitload more. Um, the reason I went into spoons was with the economic crash eight years ago, and I wanted to make smaller pieces that were more affordable. Um, I really wanted to respond to the situation, and I wanted to see if I could develop younger clients. And so I started, this was the first collection that I did, and the whole collection sold to, to one client in Hong Kong. Um, and it became a kind of, again, it became a living nightmare where these things became really, really popular. But this idea of playing with notions of function, what do they suggest, what do they include, what's removed, what do they become? And what questions come out of this work, because are any of those spoons anymore, even if I call them a spoon? These series developed on and on and on. If you think about a spoon, it's a tool. It is a defined quantity that goes into recipes. So if you, if you fuck around with that quantity, what does it become? Do they suggest more a vase, a jug? Do they relate more to serving spoons? What do they become? I've stopped doing these now. This was the last series that I did, which was two years ago and has rolled. This is um, production work that I've done with Wentworth, with the pewter people. And it was really about um, time management. And at the time that I was doing this, it was really about exploring that space and exploring the notion of bringing narrative into the work. So what do these start to suggest? What stories do they bring out? How do people respond to these? And with the forms, of course they allude to, to bubbles and to blowing and, and to a fullness and a kind of joyful form. And it's incredible how popular they've been and how far they've gone and um, in the sort of houses that they've, they've gone to. Um, but again, I, within my practice, I get really super bored quickly. And so there's a point at which I know when to stop. And if it becomes tedious, it's like, job done, move on. Mrs. E. A. Clark, who died 17 months ago, um, I nursed her through her cancer, um, which spread right the way through her body in the end. 
And I really wanted to, to work with her during her illness and actually really develop a, um, more language within the objects that I was using. And I was really fortunate to find this boxed piece. And the box I absolutely fell in love with. It wasn't about the silver, it was absolutely about the box. But the box had so much connotation to coffins. It was just, it, it, it was obscene when it came up on eBay because it just hit me in the face. These objects have never stood up, ever. They have never poured a fucking cup of tea. They have never dispensed milk or sugar. They have been polished and polished and polished. And all the value is in the material. Not about the, only, not about the usage, not about the handling, not about the sharing, nothing. And for me, I had to finish them off. I had to give them a, a decent burial, and I needed to stop what was going on. So, my mother's relationship to me is very much through the kitchen. So this piece was made in the domestic environment, again with my cooker. And I used the lead as a cancer to, again, rob this object of its purest function. In doing this, I did this um, for an exhibition that was in Sweden. And unbelievably, there was a museum in the south of Sweden that bought this piece, not as a normative collection piece, but as an education piece. And it's used for cancer patients, for uh, families that have lost people to cancer, and for people that are recovering from cancer. And it's an educational tool to talk about death in a way which we are absolutely useless as human beings in doing so. We are so removed from death. We have no notion of it. Um, it is completely alien to us. But of course, it is the only thing that is guaranteed to us when we are born. This is her teacup that she took her pills with. And there was a huge discussion as to whether the pills were a cure or whether they were a poison. 50-50 was made last year, and it's 50% pewter, 50% lead. Of course, it ends with the lip. It can go no further than the lip because then you enter the body. That is the contact point between the body and the object. Last sip. The saucer is so thin that you can actually move the fabric, the construction of the pewter. So it's almost like a skin. And with this work, I was really interested in skin. I was absolutely passionate about bringing casting into the work, which has the most appalling reputation as being cheap, economic, mass production, and completely undervalued, because it can be used in completely different ways. Filling voids, filling space. Are they dissolving or are they building? Silent embrace. And here playing around with tooling, so what can you cast into? This is where my summer really kicks off, where I actively play within the workshop. I take materials which are unexpected, but absolutely connected. My mother would only use um, homemade pastry. So the relevance of material the focus of material, the connection between material is really, really important. You can cast in pastry. It smells fantastic. It's like a bakery. Cling film, cardboard, and also testing space between objects. These plates go into plaster and then into pewter. 
the titles have the air and they're five kilos each. So it really is that space between two plates. That's what the void between two plates, sorry, two plates look like. And again, the, the factory, so Wentworth's up in Sheffield, they kept on saying, every piece is a fail. Every piece is a fail. And I'm like, send me those fails. Send me those fails. I want to see what those fails look like. And all their fails were successes for me. And so for me, the, the flatness of the plate surface was not acceptable. But for me, it really exaggerated the notion of pastry, of fingerprints, of her labor in the kitchen. The fridge door was full of aluminum foil. She would wash and reuse aluminum foil over and over again. So it had to come in somewhere. For me, I had to use that as a material. So these are hand cast ghosts of her milk jugs. Milk jugs because they're serving objects. They're not for the individual. They're, the content of jugs are shared across a group of people. It's not for the one, it's for the group. She shared and fed many. But what was really beautiful, and there's a, there's a film coming up, a short film, is the process of this. With Pewter, the, the, um, <laughs> the melting point is 180 degrees, so you can actually handle it with gloves. So it becomes a highly intimate process, whereas you think with casting you need to put on everything. With beauty, you don't need to. And again, what happens is the object flips over and reverses. So the base becomes the opening. The opening, I don't know whether you can see it. Shit, no, failed. The opening is sealed. And what you see is the motion of the liquid pewter becoming still inside. Huge Sunday platters that she would feed the whole family with. Um, and again, the transformation out from ceramic into metal is really, really important. The shock of the weight, the physicality of it is absolutely essential. And again, when you read this, you read it like it is aluminum foil, but actually, they weigh a ton. And again, this is purely by testing out. I haven't gone onto YouTube to work this out. It's like making error after error within the workshop to work out how it works. So this is a really short, I'll try and do it a couple of times. So you can see the liquid pewter swilling around the internal surface of the aluminum foil impression of the plate. And all I'm doing is I'm waiting for, poetically, I'm waiting for that liquid to cease and for it to become liquid to solid. And so again, it's purely about testing. And what you end up doing is building up a skin. And this is, you know, this is about this, what's that, about 45, cent 45 centimeters. This is where it was shown in, in Germany, in a fantastic gallery called Rosemary Jaeger, who's in the winemaking region in Hochheim in Germany. And I did a, a two-man show with Anders Lumbe, who's a Swedish silversmith. So I'm going to skip through these fast because time's running out. So Anders' pieces are really plump. They're really fertile. They're really like <clears throat> And mine are like withering old, saggy, knackered pieces. <laughs> and so I think and it was really, the combination for me worked really, really well. He had a lot of wall pieces. And so the, the views through really counteracted. And there was, there was a huge dialogue that went through the pieces. And again, we just turned up, we just worked with the materials, with, with, the, with the objects that she had and just built straight there and then. This is in a fine art gallery in Melbourne, Australia. And again, you'll start to work out that the work doesn't actually stay that much in the UK. The majority of my work goes absolutely global. So I work with all, I mean, this piece was in Hochheim, then Melbourne, Australia, then Munich, Germany, then New York. Um, then it will go to Miami, and then maybe to London. 
um, one has sold, the first one has sold uh, to a museum in the UK. Different presentation, this was in Munich for Schmuck this year, and the title of my installation was Tabernacle. And again, you know, it's incredible. The gallery was like, I want to coat the whole tabernacle in blue royal silk. And I'm like, don't touch that object. Leave it alone. And um, 10 minutes to set up, job done. Fantastic response, really connected to people. New salt piece on the bottom shelf. It's quite amazing, people cry when they see this work. It's quite, um, it's quite phenomenal. And that was one of the spoons that was in Chipstone, so I added it to this collection because it was so poignant. And I would actually add a uh, sugar piece to this collection as well. This piece fell into my lap, AKA. I mean, come on, I don't even need to title the piece anymore. Um, it arrived on eBay empty. I put it up on Facebook, and this is the power of social media, okay? I put this up empty. I haven't even made the piece and it's sold. Now the pressure to do a piece on that is like, I don't even know what to do with this anymore. But the collector was like, whatever it is, whatever you do, whatever the price is, it's mine. And it's phenomenal, this kind of image, speed, social media, global shifting stuff, incredible. I've got a few, so I, we're coming very much to the end now. What I really wanted to show you was some images of where the work ends up. We have this notion that the gallery is the end point. Incorrect. Work goes out of the transit space of the white gallery into other spaces. My work predominantly goes into domestic spaces and I love these images because I have to put up with the fact my piece is sitting next to a pink fricking log. But what I love about this is that she has taken full command, full commitment, full ownership of this object, and she stuffs it with flowers every week from the Dutch flower market. And for me, that's an absolute pleasure. This was the farty one, and um, this is a Swedish collector, and he works in the, in the city of Sweden, and he went past the gallery at night and saw it, and he went back at the weekend, and then the gallery owner showed him how it farted, and he, he makes that fart every morning at breakfast, and there's, there's, there's something about that that I really, really love, that that can impact on someone's every day in a way that I could not imagine would happen when I was sitting in the workshop working with that piece. I have to introduce Tracy Rolich, who's in the, in the mirror. This is the most recent confidential, um, I'm, I'm not even allowed to say it, so, but we've just signed a, well, we haven't signed a contract, we're waiting for contracts for a museum in the UK who has a collection of 60,000 objects which have never been shown. So the museum was built in the 50s, and the display that they have now is the display that they had in the 50s, and they have never, ever changed it, moved it. The labeling is the same, the objects are the same, the woods, everything is the same. It is hideous. But the idea of getting the key to 60,000 objects that are valued by someone as worthy of collecting is super exciting. And what's beautiful about this project is that the museum is getting a new building, and so we're in direct communication and correspondence with the architects. So the architects have to ask us within the residency how we work, interact, and move around the building. And to be given that opportunity to be able to affect a building to that level, super exciting. Done. Thank you very much.